Well, I believe we're in section two now, looking at the uh, reasons why prophecy is uh, difficult to interpret. Difficult because of reasons we've already gone over, the confusion in uh, the ways that different scholars use terms. They use the same terms, but with different meanings. And we have to look carefully into their writings and see in their own context how they're using those terms, like literal. And then secondly, uh, the sheer amount of prophecy. There's so much of it, one-fourth to one-fifth of the uh, part of Scripture is actually predictive at the time it's written. It's speaking about something future, uh, from Genesis uh, to Revelation. And uh, the uh, great volume, the amount of prophecy, uh, gives us an awful lot that we need to interpret. And uh, it's been for me a great thrill, as well as extremely hard work to uh, and sometimes very hard on the eyes, to um, pour over books, over journal articles, uh, pour over my Bible, uh, Hebrew text, Greek text, depending on Old Testament or New Testament, and, and to think about uh, different issues, even different little parts of verses, and the word study, context, grammar, cross-reference, the other principles we've looked at this semester and try to decide uh, what is the uh, most correct uh, interpretation of a given passage. Uh, uh, how can I really uh, show integrity toward God and men as I interpret this passage? Let me be true to God even if I must part from some system. Let it be the Savior, not the system, that dictates my interpretation, that drives me and uh, keep working on it that way. It's just um, with a great sense of confidence, though, that I come to you and know that this premillennial faith in the area of matters of prophecy that so many have held, uh, that we, our school, holds today, is a system that uh, does hold up uh, to, the, to the most brilliant uh, exercises of scholarly study. Uh, we've had uh, some very great scholars in our history who have taken the premillennial faith, uh, George N. H. Peters. You may never have heard that name, George N. H. Peters, who was a pastor in a small church a long time ago. And he wrote this uh, three-volume work called The Theocratic Kingdom, meaning the God-ruling kingdom on this earth, and studied these areas with great, great, great intensity and over a long period of time and read everything within his day a couple hundred years ago. And my, did he study the different passages of the Old and the New Testaments to see what does, what does the Scripture teach? What kind of system? Amillennial, premillennial, whenmillennial, people that are just going in circles, panmillennial, however it pans out, that's what I'll be. Uh, some people don't know what, what they believe, and they're just waiting to see, uh, so that... George N. H. Peters then finally wrote that book, and uh, I remember when I was a student at Dallas Seminary, went back uh, one, one uh, summer to, to uh, help uh, my father-in-law in, -law in uh, upstate New York, uh, working on the farm, and took those three volumes of George N. H. Peters, uh, checked it out of the library, and uh, went back uh, and uh, poured over that at night on weekends, about 3,000 pages it was. Uh, not reading every page, but reading enough of it to get the substance of it. Why this man uh, would write such a prolific work of such depth and conclude for the premillennial perspective of interpreting prophecy and, and was really uh, thrilled and impacted by that. I've also been impacted by others. But the very amount of prophecy that would uh, call forth like 3,000 pages to discuss these issues in uh, George N. H. Peters. And then D, the, the argument over prophecy. There's been so many, there have been so many different views, so many different arguments put forth. Uh, every time you um, read another book, if it's by a scholar uh, who knows what he's doing very well, uh, he will mention different kinds of arguments on different kinds of passages, and it almost would make your head spin at first. Uh, you need to take the, the weeks, the months, the years of study to get leveled out on that. And, uh, of course, um, 
I've never stopped studying. I continue to study. I was studying last night on the New Covenant. Uh, I was looking at Psalm 110 this morning, and I've been looking at it several times here lately, on uh, the idea of a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That's Christ, and how that fits with his kingship, and when it's fulfilled, and so on. First Advent, Second Advent, both, whatever. And uh, so the very argument over prophecy uh, we uh, see as a problem. But let's uh, remind ourselves when we see that there is an argument over prophecy, and we could get overwhelmed by that, let's remind ourselves that no matter what kind of scripture you're in, there are arguments. If you're in parables uh, that Jesus told, there are many different views, many different arguments by different scholars once you become aware. If you're studying uh, biblical typology in the Old Testament, like lamb, lamb, Christ the lamb, then you uh, find that there are many different arguments to become aware of. And if you're just studying plain problem passages like baptism for the dead, 1 Corinthians 15, Jephthah's vow in Judges 11, did he offer his daughter in bodily sacrifice, or did he offer her over for perpetual virginity. In what way did he offer her that would fit with scripture and fit with what that context claims? So also uh, when um, Saul visited the witch of Endor in 1 Samuel 28 and Samuel appeared to him and they talked. Did Samuel really appear bodily? Did God bring him back from the dead? Or was that a vision? There's three or four main views. So no matter uh, what passage you're looking at in scripture of whatever type it is, prophecy or else, or, or some other, there are problems, there are arguments. Uh, once we become aware, so let's not kid ourselves and think, well, prophecy is sort of alone, it's, it's the problem area. Yes, it does have problems, but boy, do these other passages also have problems. And that's just the way it is in scripture. As uh, different minds have poured over these things, grappled with them, tried to wrestle and decide what view to take, and have thus come up with different arguments. Uh, notice the first uh, sub-point, the problem on discussion of the issues, that uh, one of the reasons there's such an argument over prophecy is that as uh, issues are discussed, notice those other sub-points, no person has learned all of the truth. No one knows the whole picture with perfect accuracy and objectivity. None of us are perfect. So we come with our imperfect minds and abilities to try to uh, interpret scripture. Some come with very little training, almost infants in the faith. Other come, others come as towering giants of scholarship, but with different viewpoints. And so they, they come to different conclusions. Uh, so that no person has learned all the truth or sees the whole picture and has all the answers. And uh, we who come along need to study different possibilities, grapple with the text itself. I often come back just to the scripture itself and just read, 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 read it again, read it again, read it again, study, keep pouring over, asking God, pleading with him to show me light on it. And uh, because sometimes we can get so lost in reading articles, uh, commentaries, doing word studies, in sources outside the Bible to help us in the Bible that we do not really become biblical people. And uh, years ago I made this commitment that I would be a Bible person, that I would uh, spend a lot of time in the text. And uh, weigh everything by scripture and make sure that whatever uh, a person claimed to be a view would fit with scripture or would not. As far as I could tell. Uh, I want you to do that too, hope you will. But we don't, none of us know all of the picture. And I mentioned here reasons why we, that's such a problem because of lack of adequate preparation. Some people have not had much preparation, so it's, it's no wonder that they might come up with very wacky views at times on uh, passages. I mean, uh, some people come up with views at times that would almost curl your toenails. Mm -hmm. they're, they're so weird that uh, you'd say just about nobody would agree with them on this. Uh, lack of adequate preparation. They may mean well, but uh, they, haven't, they don't have the equipment to uh, go very far in. It's like if I tried to plunge into auto mechanics, uh, knowing as little as I know about engines. 
And I might intend well, but I would really bungle things. Do it unintentionally, of course, but still it'll come out very badly. Same way in biblical study. And secondly, uh, some people have a lack of special time. Uh, they're given to the, the machine shop or the farm or several children to take care of, uh, whatever it may be, and they, they lack adequate time due to other responsibilities. They do not have that special added time that you have as God has put you in seminary or will put you in a pastorate where you can devote a lot of your time to study of the Bible. And uh, we need to realize that that's one of the reasons why some people may have difficulties uh, maybe beyond our own and, and need our help of Ephesians 4 where God has provided these teachers, pastor teachers, to, to equip others. Ephesians 4, 11 and following. And then, then thirdly, we find that uh, this is a problem because of a lack of vital interest. Some people don't have a vital interest. Let's face it, they, their minds are duller and they, they might care less about uh, interpreting prophecy. They'll let somebody else do it. And then they'll come on Sunday and listen and see what they think. And so many of our lay people who claim to be Christians spend very little time each week in the scriptures. Uh, no wonder there's such a problem. I even read an article this week on uh, unbelieving believers in the church. People in the church who claim to be born again, who apparently are not born again, and who are open to all kinds of other views, uh, don't even believe that Christ arose from the dead, believe that every faith is as good as every other faith, and uh, very high statistics on some of these areas, it would all, you know, almost stun us. Stun us that, that the people who claim to be born again would hold these things. And then fourthly, lack of objectivity. Some people have not ever had a course in logic. Uh, they've never, if they had a, have not had such a course, they have never learned to think logically. I oftentimes in a Sunday school class will throw out a question what does this passage say about so-and-so? And you get some of the most startling answers pulled right out of the outer spaces that have nothing to do with the passage itself whatsoever. I mean, it is really a stunner at times. And uh, my attitude has been not to put those people down. So you nitwit, don't you see what it says here? Or in some other way put them down but say appreciate your suggestion are there others and then come back <laughs> and maybe I'll get another shot at it later with those people uh, having treated them kindly that I wouldn't get if I put them down in fact they may never, never even come back so we need to be loving people Christ like people as well as as uh, be interested in getting people into the scripture uh, lack of ability, and we need, to, we need to say thank God that I have been given some ability by his sovereign choices about matters. Thank God for that. Let, now let me use this to the utmost so that I can help others. But as I sense that they don't have such abilities as God has given me, let me then contribute to them. Let them then contribute to me in certain ways. But, but it's just true. Lack of ability. And the lack of ability to think logically. And, and if we will, uh, in a Sunday school class or in a, in a pulpit, teach others over the weeks, the months, the years, we will find that we will train people who will learn to think logically. They will learn to see the importance of looking at a biblical passage and looking at the context. They will learn how to find the main thought of a context. They will learn how to see the other subpoints that flow with that main point. They'll learn it, they'll catch it as we patiently instruct them with love. And then B, there has been misrepresentation. It's true that uh, scholars who are amillennial scholars will sometimes, sometimes not always, will misrepresent premillennial people as teaching some weird, wacky, uh, rigidly literal idea of the scriptures. And it's true that some premills do that. Uh, it's true that some who are not premills do that. It's also true that some amills teach weird things about passages. 
uh, there's been misrepresentation. And then some, some uh, pre-mills will, will refer to, to amils and say, oh, they're Romish. They, uh, they spiritualize passages. They allegorize scripture and write them off instead of really dealing with them. And so, and so there's been misrepresentation. Some, uh, you know, the Amel people who are really cool scholars do earnestly want to get the literal meaning of the passage. They really are after that. That's what they're looking for. That's their motive. We don't want to attribute some false motive to them. As far as they know, within their own honest minds, they are seeking to get the truth of Scripture. Many of them are. People like Simon Kistemaker, this great commentator. William Hendrickson on the New Testament. Uh, Vern Poitras from Westminster Seminary. They're really trying to get the meaning of Scripture, even though they would take a nonmillennial point of view, different from uh, the viewpoint this seminary stands for, premillennialism. Uh, so if we discuss them, we need to realize that and be candid and right about the way we refer to them. Hope they'll be right about the way they, the way they refer to us. They may not, but we still, Jesus said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, not do unto others as they have done unto you, so on. So we see that uh, there are these various uh, things that cause uh, study of prophecy to be quite difficult, but then we have point C, there are areas of agreement as well as disagreement. Let me mention some of these between amillennialism and premillennialism. Let me just quickly say that amillennialism, Simon Kistemaker, Vern Poitras, William Hendrickson, such scholars. Uh, Amillennialists believe that we are in the millennium today, these 2,000 years of the church age. That the 1,000 years mentioned in Revelation 20 is not to be taken literally as a 1,000 years, but rather refers to a long, perfect type of period of time. Could be 2,000 years for that matter. Uh, they, that we are in it today, Christ is ruling today, as Revelation 20 says he is. And that when this millennium is over, when this present age comes to an end, when Christ comes, then there will be a great, a massive final judgment, and then we'll go right into the eternal state. There will be no millennial time after Christ's coming, when Israel will be regathered to its land, uh, and uh, various uh, details of the Old Testament prophecies will the, then be fulfilled because they tend to feel that these various prophecies get fulfilled in the present age already or in the eternal state in some spiritual proper way, they think. Uh, so they uh, believe differently than premillennialists who believe that Christ will come previous, pre, previous to the millennium. He will come and then the millennium will follow him, follow his coming. A future thousand year period during which Christ will be re uh, Israel-like people will be regathered to their land in, in uh, fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, and so on. All right, so, but there are areas of agreement. Let's mention some of these. God will triumph. All true Christians believe that. Uh, God will be the eternal king. We all celebrate that. Christ will come, second advent. Glad day, glad day. Bodily resurrection, we agree. We, we agree on the difference between the intermediate state and the eternal state. The intermediate state is we go into that when we die, and then we are in that intermediate state between death and the future resurrection. We call it the intermediate state. Because it's intermediate, it's between our death and our future bodily resurrection when we'll receive new bodies. And then after we receive new bodies, we'll go into our ultimate, final, glorious state. We agree on that, that uh, there, there's, um, there's a difference between the intermediate state, which is temporary, and then the ultimate or the eternal state. Once it's, it's going, it, it will never end. We agree on eternal punishment, many of us, eternal conscious punishment in hell. Although there have been some scholars in recent years who have risen up who, you know, who, who teach that a God of love would not uh, uh, so punish people. So in order for him to be loving, he would have to uh, have a very quick annihilation, wipe them out, 
so that they would not have to suffer eternally. But uh, most of us have believed pre-mill or amill in a um, pre-mill or amill in a uh, in eternal punishment. We agree on specific reward that uh, many of us believe that uh, that God will, uh, in some equitable, some proper, some honest way, will look at our works, our fruit, and will give different um, capacities, gradations, degrees, stations, roles of reward uh, to different believers as he equitably sees distinctions in our lives. Different degrees of reward. 1 Corinthians 3.8, every month man will receive his own reward according to his own labor. 1 Corinthians 3.8. Or uh, Luke uh, 19, the parable of the pounds, Luke 19, 12 through 27. The nobleman, the ten servants, he goes away, comes back to see what they've done with their pounds he committed to their trust. And then Luke chooses three of them, Jesus chooses three of them to give us an accounting on, and two of them were faithful, the third was not, remember? And then, uh, of course, the two were rewarded, the third one apparently was not. Well, anyway, we, we need to get, uh, and one, one of the servants receives uh, authority over ten cities, one receives authority over five cities, so that shows a distinction in their capacity, their level, their degree of reward. Uh, well, almost all amillennial and premillennial scholars believe that in some sense there will be an equitable differentiation made by God on what will be the proper reward to give to each believer. We're talking here about saved people, not people who claim to be believers but are not really saved. They'll go to hell, of course. Even if they were in the church and claimed to be believers when they were not. Okay. Uh, so we have um, agreement on that. Pretty much, although even there, there's some disagreement. Some believe there won't be any degrees of reward. Everybody will get exactly the same thing. Some premills believe that. Some amills believe that. So we have um, Craig Blomberg at Denver Seminary, who believes there will be no degrees of reward. Premillennial. We we will agree on the Book of Life. In Revelation 3, 5, that uh, the names of believers are recorded in the Lamb's book of life. All those who have eternal life are there. We believe, we believe pretty much in a literal city, a new Jerusalem, forever. Revelation 21 and 22. There will actually be a city, a community, uh, where we as believers will be the inhabitants. Although even there, there are some like Robert Gundry of Westmont College here in California, in Santa Barbara, Robert Gundry believes that the descriptions in Revelation 21 and 20, he's a pre-mill, he's a dispensationalist of a sort. He believes that the descriptions in Revelation 21, 22, so many cubits, length, breadth, height, are merely there to be a very picturesque description of people, not a place. He doesn't deny there will be a place, but he says the description is not a description of a literal city. It's a community of people. And he wrote a whole journal article to try to prove that view. So there are differentiations. There are some that don't believe these things, but then I'm talking about the majority. Most of us believe in lordship salvation, amel or premil. That uh, when Christ becomes your savior, he becomes your lord. And the different believers know him in different depths, different uh, degrees of thoroughness of uh, commitment, of obedience, of fruit, but that all do know him in some real degree as Lord, whom they follow. And they diff that's different from non-lordship salvation, which many pre believe. But I don't know of any amils who believe that. Uh, I think as far as I know, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised because <laughs> there are all kinds of surprises in the, in the theological world. You're always discovering someone who takes an odd, oddball sort of view, different from his brethren. It used to bother me a lot because I thought, well, if the Holy Spirit is really leading our lives, why don't we all come to the same view? And then I, it occurred to me that 
the Holy Spirit is unlimited and perfect, and we're not. <laughs> and that's the basic reason why we come to different views. And the Holy Spirit who controls different believers controls them in different degrees and different levels of maturity as well, and so in different depths. From uh, infancy right on up to uh, high maturity godliness in the Lord. So there are areas of agreement. Um, eternal service, Revelation 22, two, uh, 4 through 5. 22, 4 through 5, his, his bond servants shall serve him. That's forever. Do you know what we're going to be doing forever? The most exciting, most hilarious thing you could ever dream of. We're going to be serving God. And there's nothing better than that. Getting a sweet taste of it now, but we haven't seen the half of it yet. We haven't seen the hundredth of it yet. Of uh, what God has prepared for those who love him. But when the time comes, he will reveal that to us, and I uh, get uh, strong suspicions from Scripture that it's really going to be something. We're really going to enjoy it. We believe in eternal service, and I, I just look forward to serving him forever. We believe in the unity of the redeemed. We believe that in the New Jerusalem, finally, all redeemed Jews, all redeemed Gentiles, Enoch, Abel, Abraham, Sarah, right on through, the Apostle Paul, Billy Graham, John MacArthur, all believers of all time will be unified in the New Jerusalem. The Jewish people who are saved will not be off in a separate camp. But we will all be combined with the same blessings. Pre-mill, amill. Uh, most of us agree on that. Although, of course, during the millennium, before the ultimate state, before the New Jerusalem, yes, during the millennium there will be differences when God will especially uh, allow the Israelite, Israelite people to be central, primary, and will bless them with bland blessings and various other details the Old Testament is pretty clear about. So there are a lot of areas of agreement. I remember being in Scotland for uh, some years to work on my uh, doctorate in New Testament and, and uh, going to uh, a Christian group of Amiel people in Stonehaven, Scotland, near, uh, near Aberdeen. And uh, I don't believe you could ever find a sweeter more sacrificial, more loving group of believers, men and women, utterly committed to Jesus Christ, singing the songs of Zion, so to speak. What blessed fellowship we had. We were not there in Scotland being poor students until um, Hugh and Meg Duncan made contact with us some miles away from where they lived in Stonehaven and said, do you need a car to use? Uh, would you like to go, Meg said to Mildred, my wife, uh, would you like to go with me to a, a warehouse where we can buy groceries, uh, a lower rate and so on. Uh, all kinds of helpfulness. Come to our home, share with us. Uh, very godly people too. Talking about the Lord, sweetly. And, uh, and they invited me to teach Romans and had other opportunities and I could teach Romans and I, I made up my mind that while I was there, I was not going to make prophecy. I knew they differed on prophecy from what I believed. I was not going to make that an area of disagreement. I was not going to be uh, meddlesome and quarrelsome. I had heard about a young guy from Dallas Seminary who had come over there shortly before I arrived there, a young buck who thought he knew everything, and he came over to uh, convert all of them to premillennialism. And he was very argumentative. And uh, the legacy he left was one of uh, hate in the minds of these people. They remembered him as one to despise, uh, one to keep your distance from, because he was so unloving. And uh, that tipped me off, you know, that was one of the warning signals to uh, show love, show opportunity. You know, teach them Romans, uh, teach them what you can, but don't argue with them. When you get an opportunity, you can always share on matters of prophecy, but don't let that be your central issue. Uh, we need to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. 
Uh, so there are areas of agreement. We're thankful for that. And uh, someday uh, these will melt away. Uh, these disagreements will melt away and we'll, uh, you know, we'll be in eternity and, and you know, the Amels will turn to us and say, you were right. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> we all made it. And uh, we have the same blessings and so on. And uh, we, we will turn to certain people and say, you were right, you know. <laughs> my spell on Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock, I will build my church with so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, now I know different, and so on. And isn't that great? I was limited, but God isn't, you know. And Praise God that he gave us that fling. He gave us that opportunity to see if we couldn't understand his word. We made it right on some points, but we were wrong on others. But here we are. Uh, it all depends on grace, finally. But while we're here now, it does matter. It surely matters to uh, try to be accurate. So then we have the different views laid out. Amillennial, we just mentioned a few minutes ago what they believe. We're not in the millennium. We're in the millennium today. Uh, so there will be uh, no necessary millennium after the second coming. Premills, however, believe that uh, we're not in the millennium today. A thousand years not here yet, but we'll come after Christ's second advent. Okay, so we have Amills. We have certain top people who are in the amillennial camp. We might mention some of them here. Uh, some of them are mentioned in the uh, paragraph here. As far as commentators are concerned, let's look at some of those. The right, the great commentaries, people like Linsky, near the end of that uh, paragraph. That's the uh, second paragraph under Omillennial. R.C.H. Lenski, great Lutheran Omillennial commentator. Uh, commentaries on every book of the New Testament. William Hendrickson, Simon Kistemaker. In uh, about 1981, when William Hendrickson died, right in the midst of uh, writing his long series of commentaries on the New Testament, having not completed that series, but gone in death, they selected Simon Kistemaker to pick up on that and finish it. He did. He's finished it now in Revelation and 1st and 2nd Corinthians and so on. Just finished about a year or so ago. Two years ago, I guess. Very good commentators. Vern Poitras could be added there from Westminster Seminary, Philadelphia. Vern Poitras, P-O-Y-T-H-R-E-S-S, -S, uh, who also has a commentary on Revelation. Uh, my uh, commentators for biblical expositors, the new edition is supposed to come out any week now, and it will add about 360 new commentators. And uh, there will be several, something like 15 more on the book of Revelation. Among these you'll find Poitras and Kistemaker and some others and the paragraphs describing their common, their amillennial commentators, their commentaries. And then we have the postmillennial view. Why is it called postmillennial? Because post means after, after the thousand years. It's the idea that during this present church age, things will drift into a golden era. A millennium. And then after the millennium, second advent, Christ will come, and there'll be a final judgment, and then the eternal state. That is, when Christ comes second advent after the millennium, post-millennial, there will be a brief time of tribulation. There'll be judgment. Righteous, unrighteous, separated into their destinies in the eternal state. Uh, in some ways, very much like the Almonial view. When we, once we get to the second advent, very much like the second advent, like the Almonial view. Uh, both views believe in a second advent, final great judgment, and then the eternal state. The difference is that Almonialists believe we're in the millennium today, this whole age. But the postmillennialists believe that this present age will only gradually come into a golden era, utopia type time. In uh, more recent years, uh, since about the 1980s, there has come up to be this, um, come to be this um, 
new spin, new version of the old postmillennial view, which is a very old view. A new um, kind of way of looking at that is called the reconstructionist view or theonomist or dominion theology outshoot. And it is um, described here in this last paragraph on uh, postmillennial thought. Uh, it's called uh, dominion theology because they believe that doctors, lawyers, dentists, housewives will um, infiltrate society with the law of God, uh, Mosaic law, uh, its principles, its moral standards, and will become pervasive in spreading this biblical viewpoint of how to live in every realm of society. And so the dominion of God will be recognized over human life as people submit to his law. It's called reconstruction because they believe that society will be reconstructed in a golden era when people will, will submit to God's law in a very uh, great way. A great stream of people will do that. So it's called reconstruction of society. It's called um, theonomous because those two words put together mean God law, God's law. God's law will rule. The law of God ruling. Uh, through dentists doing their work, meeting with people, through lawyers, through doctors, through housewives, farmers, machinists, whatever, uh, throughout the world. Uh, so there will come about a uh, millennial time before the second advent. And shortly before the second advent, there will be a, a tribulation time and then the second advent, then the eternal state. Uh, who among the... Um, the uh, theonomist, what I point to, notice commentators that are mentioned there in that final uh, couple of inches, David Chilton, commentary on the book of Revelation, David Chilton, and also a couple lines later, David Clark. Uh, both Chilton and Clark have written commentaries on the whole book of Revelation, done all in a uh, postmillennial or uh, theonomist uh, perspective. I'll be very frank with you, although I respect these scholars for their, for their uh, earnest um, scholarly effort. Uh, I believe they come up with uh, explanations at times that just are very, very, very weird. And that have nothing to do with any kind of a literal, meaningful, natural interpretation of passages. Uh, that's my own uh, bigoted view. Uh, I realize that they have their, their bigoted views too. But I believe it's really not bigoted. I believe it's a straightforward, fair thing to say that, uh, that they do come up with some very strange views of uh, passages. If you want to see how strange they, they can do it, look at uh, Kenneth Gentry. He's mentioned here. Kenneth Gentry. And he has a long chapter in a book called Four Views in the Book of Revelation. Four Views in the Book of Revelation. Uh, he was one of four scholars asked to contribute a chapter. Dr. Thomas of our faculty was also asked to contribute a chapter on the premillennial dispensational view. But Gentry represents the theonomist view of the book of Revelation. A very good scholar, and, and he will show you in, in, a, in a few pages uh, how he pulls things together in the book of Revelation his way. And he will take the seals the trumpets, the bowls, these judgments that are described in the book of Revelation, chapter 6 through, uh, um, through 16. And uh, we'll see these fulfilled in the Roman legions of the first century when they were uh, assaulting places like Jerusalem. Very hard for me to see that when I look at these descriptions in the chapters of the Revelation. But he sees these things there. So we need to, to follow him and see how he sees them so that we can be honest and, and have integrity in the way we represent him and hope that he will then be honest with integrity to represent us correctly. But he's a very good one. And then, and then to read Dr. Thomas's chapter where he tries to do it with a natural, plausible, uh, hermeneutic uh, to take things more as they would appear to mean in the text and show how these fit with Old Testament passages in a consistent uh, analogy of the faith uh, throughout Scripture.
Then there's the premillennial viewpoint. It breaks down into several different subsections, actually non-dispensational. Uh, premillennial because these scholars believe that Christ will come, second advent, pre, previous to the millennium. There will be a millennium following the second advent. Uh, there will be certain Old Testament promises fulfilled during that millennium before, before the eternal state, before the new Jerusalem kind of life. And so we have a number of scholars here. Uh, the one I would pick out probably is, is uh, one of the best representatives is uh, George Ladd, L-A-D-D. -D. Uh, several books are mentioned here near the end of that paragraph. George Ladd taught just a few miles from here in Pasadena at Fuller Theological Seminary. I used to live right across the street from there on what was called Ford Street at that time. Now they, it's no longer there. It, it's, it, there's an there's a avenue down through there, but it's not a Ford Street. But I lived uh, with a big glass window that overlooked the Fuller campus and was working with uh, Campus Crusade for Christ on their uh, National Collegiate Challenge magazine. Got to walk across the street, use the Fuller Library, and know a lot of people there and so on. George Ladd, The Blessed Hope, or Crucial Questions About the Kingdom of God, or Jesus and the Kingdom. And he will take a premillennial view that uh, sounds pretty liberal, uh, li pretty literal, not liberal, pretty literal at times, and will thrill your heart with that. And he will even take things in the book of, like the millennium in Revelation 20, thousand years, in a literal kind of a way. Uh, but one of the things that bothers me is that he feels that the church is the spiritual Israel today. The spiritual Israel today. We are, the church is the spiritual Israel today that we, um, things pass over from Israel to the church, and in Galatians 6.16, we are what are called the Israel of God. Uh, once he's made that great claim, in many passages, one wonders then why he sees any necessity at all left to claim any distinction for Israel in the future. If he has sort of wiped it out by merging Israel with the church today, it really bothers me. Uh, to see a continuity, a consistency in that kind of a viewpoint. He also believes that the kingdom is here today and will come more fully at the uh, second advent. And he's a great scholar, very uh, well uh, studied, very learned. And I uh, respected him very highly, although can only agree with him on some points. There is also a, um, another kind of um, premillennialism, which is premillennial dispensational, that tends to feel that, uh, well, there are different branches of it. Agree with uh, Ladd that there will be a future millennium, but give more of a Jewish flavor to it, more of an Old Testament Israeli flavor to the future millennium than he gave it, and uh, argue more for the... Uh, lack of continuity between Israel and the church in many ways, argue against them the church being the spiritual Israel and say the church is the church. Uh, Christ said in Matthew uh, 16, 18, I will, future tense, I will build my church. He didn't say I will rebuild it as if uh, his work with the church was a sort of a rebuilding of what he had done with Israel, a new spin on it. He said, I will build my church, as if it's something distinctive in future. Uh, and I believe that's true. And that the church is the church during the present age, but Israel is Israel. And uh, when the time will come, uh, God uh, in the future will uh, indeed uh, bring Israeli people back into their own land and give them a very distinctive future, such as is described in many of the major and the minor prophets and also uh, for which the book of Revelation makes plenty of space. Revelation 7 mentioning the 12 tribes of Israel, 144,000, specifying the very tribes. Some say, well, that's the church, but natural normative hermeneutics, why would he mention the very tribes? Why would it be necessary to do that if he's talking about the church? How would that be a normative, natural way to understand that passage? It sounds like Jewish people, definitely there. So why not take it that way? for what it's worth. Uh, so there are differences of opinion. 
sometimes they seem slight, but one once gets it, one gets into them, they turn out to be down the road pretty pretty broad distinctions in uh, the way one handles a lot of different passages in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. So there is this other kind of uh, premillennialism, which is a dispensational kind of of uh, premillennialism. Yes, yes, there will be a future kingdom uh, with a very Jewish-Israeli flavor uh, after the second advent. And usually this second type believes in a pre-tribulational rapture, pre-tribulational rapture, the church raptured out of this world into heaven previous to the uh, tribulation period of seven years, uh, which the book of Revelation <laughs> describes quite a bit about. Whereas the lad type of view, the premillennial non-dispensational view, would hold that the church will go through the tribulation period and then be raptured right at the end to have their new bodies and to um, reign with Christ during the uh, millennium that will follow the second advent. So there are differences that involve how one interprets uh, pa rapture passages like 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, to name a couple. There are also are differences in whether one says uh, the church is the spiritual Israel today or whether one says the church is not the spiritual Israel today but is the church distinctive from Israel. Uh, there are differences there. Uh, now among the uh, Laddian group, Lad would be a great uh, example among the premillennial uh, dispensational some of the top ones would be, let's look at this list. If you wanted, it's hard to read everything at first, and students need to get started in certain works that would probably be more um, normative works that would speed up their uh, early understanding of things. Charles Ryrie's book. It's several paragraphs down, about five paragraphs down. It starts with normative dispensationalism. And about an inch below that, Charles Ryrie the basis of the premillennial faith, and then even better book, Dispensationalism Today, uh, is, a, is a good explanation of what's called a normative dispensational view. It's called normative by many people, although many people don't like that word normative because they think that makes them seem unnormative. And they recoil against it. But it, it is called, uh, for the sake of trying to find some kind of a descriptive word, it's called a normative because it's what normatively uh, many of the uh, better known dispensationalists have held. At least until quite recent years when progressive dispensationalism came in in the 1980s. And today is, it, 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 progressive dispensationalism is, is differentiated from normative dispensationalism. All right, so I'll say more about that in just a little bit. Ryrie's book is a, is a good one, and then among the commentators, uh, I should mention Alva J. McLean here, about another inch and a half down in the list. Alva J. McLean was the president at, West, at um, Grace Theological Seminary in Winona Lake, Indiana, from which we've gotten several of our leaders, Dr. Mayhew, Dr. Busnitz, and then Dr. Cragen, uh, such men. Grace Theological Seminary, one on Lake, Indiana. Uh, McLean was the president for many years. He's in glory now, but he, he wrote this book called The Greatness of the Kingdom, about this thick, uh, which takes the kingdom theme from Genesis through Revelation and explains why in the Old Testament, why in the Gospels, why in the book of Acts, why in the epistles, it's better to take a premillennial view than a nominal view. So it's a good place to begin because it just sensibly moves right through scripture, one can see scripture as well as the argument. And then of course, um, among commentators, Dr. Thomas's work on uh, the book of Revelation, two volumes, as well as his work on First and Second Thessalonians. And then I mentioned also the uh, Bible knowledge commentary down near, near the end of that uh, paragraph, Dallas Seminary puts out, two volumes, an Old Testament volume, a New Testament volume, the Bible Knowledge Commentary, it has the premillennial kind of view in uh, various major prophets, minor prophets, New Testament, and so on. Uh, usually done quite well. Among the uh, theological journals, our own journal, 
the Master Seminary Journal, and then, of course, the Bibliotheca Sacru, put out by Dallas Seminary uh, for many years. In fact, put out since, since 1844. And then Dallas Seminary took it over sometime in this century, because Dallas Seminary didn't start till 1924. And uh, so for many decades, Dallas Seminary has put it out. It, it was put out long before Dallas Seminary existed. Okay. Dan? I don't remember who put it out. It was a non-Dallas Seminary group. And whether it changed during that time, I couldn't tell you. But Okay, uh, so um, it is a good source because it gives volumes. Uh, our journal also gives, gives uh, articles. And then the Grace Theological Seminary put out the Grace Journal. Until fairly recent years, they came out with that. Uh, for many years, they did. So it has a lot of articles that um, give a premillennial explanation on key passages, key issues, and so on. We have all of those in our library. When I, when I was a student at Dallas, I remember how that I got so engrossed in this. I had come out of a, a secular university, Arizona State, and kind of had to start there not knowing much at all. And, but with a very intense interest, and, and I thought, well, during the summers, when I'm free from other classes, I'll just go read, 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 read. On uh, a lot of these books that have been mentioned in my classes that I had no time to read during the semester, and I would then read like George and H. Peters, The Theocratic Kingdom, and I, one summer I took uh, all the Amiel books, oh, 20 or 30 of them that were possible at that time, and read through these and made my notes, which I still have today so that I could really know firsthand what the Amillennialists believed. Uh, not uh, listening to Dr. Wolver at Dallas tell me secondhand what they believed, but which what would water it down somewhat, generalize it, but what they said they believed. That was a great help to me, and, and to read, uh, uh, you know, read a lot of the, the uh, pre-mill books and uh, find out a whole lot more than I was finding out in my classes, because there was more time to do it. And I, I urge that upon you as well, to... Uh, to have a really high standard in terms of your uh, go-getter attitude to, uh, to be a good, well-fitted servant of God, to know these issues, whether you're going to be in the pastorate or in teaching, whatever, so that when you would speak, you would, you would be able to represent them correctly, honestly, and well, and hopefully in a fluid manner, and be able to take a lot of material and boil it down into a few sentences and still be right about it because you've mastered it. So we have uh, John MacArthur is a good example of that. A very, very well-read pastor. All right, so then in the last few, de uh, few uh, couple of decades, since about the 1980s, we've had the um, progressive dispensationalism come about. It's called progressive because they believe in a greater continuity, is, the, is one word, between Old and New Testament, between Israel, Old Testament, and Church and New Testament, continuity. Or it might be called progression of thought. More of that than, uh, than they felt um, normative dispensationalists believed in, because they felt that normative dispensationalists just made Israel and the Church so distinct from one another that they didn't really see New Testament places where uh, things promised to Israel had any kind of fulfillment in the church. That, that these uh, various details of Old Testament passages to Israel would have to wait past the church age and be fulfilled beyond it. So they call themselves people of continuity, of uh, progression. Uh, that's the way they're referred to by uh, those against them as well. And then uh, the other group is known as normative dispensationalism. Now, Daryl Bach in his book, uh, it's not his book, but it's a book uh, by Herbert Bateman in 1999, Herbert Bateman IV, who was the general editor of a little paperback book called um, Three Issues in Contemporary Dispensationalism. Three Issues in Contemporary Dispensationalism. And it's a book where they invited um, progressive dispensationalists to write chapters and then normative dispensationalists then to write a, a response on, on an issue like the relationship between Israel and the church, or is Christ on a Davidic throne today? 
and is he fulfilling his kingship duties in the world today? Uh, then they also invited the normative dispensationalists to write chapters, and then they gave the um, progressive dispensationalists, like Daryl Bach, an opportunity then to respond to these. So you get both, both shots at it, both viewpoints. Uh, so Daryl Bach, in that book, says that he doesn't like the word normative dispensationalism because he feels he's normative, because he feels that he's using a literal natural hermeneutic in the way he allows New Testament passages to uh, help interpret Old Testament passages. And then Elliot Johnson, who uh, contends for the normative dispensationalist view, retarts, re, um, responds to that by saying he doesn't like Daryl Bach using the word progressive because that makes it sound like normative dispensationalists are not progressive. And there are a number of ways in which they do believe that from the Old Testament things do flow forward in the New Testament and always flow forward. And uh, I believe both of them are right in a sense that uh, these titles are not uh, the best titles. We have to realize that. There's a lot of normativism in both views. There's a lot of progression in both views, really. Uh, so they um, have some interesting um, asides and it's a good book to read to see the two different views. But, of course, that's just two different views of dispensationalism. We, we even have other kinds of dispensationalism, like the pre-wrath view of recent years, Marvin Rosenthal, and um, people like him. Um, Van Campen is another one, the book called The Sign. Van Campen, K-A-M-P-E-N. He used to be a tremendous contributor to our uh, seminary. God, in the early days, really used him to uh, help our seminary with many, many thousands of dollars. A very close friend of John MacArthur's until uh, some years down, then farther down the line, he got really engrossed in this study of, that led him to the pre-wrath view and to the book called The Sign. And I remember... Uh, there was a time several years ago, but probably back in the early 90s, I don't recall exactly, but I remember I was sicker than a dog. And John MacArthur said, Jim, come with me. Come with Dick Mayhew and me, and we're going to Wrightwood, and we're going to spend a whole day talking with Van Camp and to try to persuade him to come back away from his pre wrath view to a normative dispensational view. And so we went up to Wrightwood, and I was doing everything I could to just bear it. Uh, my head was spinning, I was really sick, but when the president says come, you jump, and you say how high, you know, so uh, God gave much grace uh, to me to think, I think logically, but we spent the whole day uh, with uh, Van Kampen with his uh, chalkboard trying to persuade us and we trying to persuade him, neither one of us persuaded the other. He would give us his spin on a passage in Matthew 24, we would point out things in a context that would show that was impossible and not likely and so on. But his mind was made up, our minds were made up, and uh, we didn't get anywhere, except we had a lot of good friendship. And the Lord took, his, took him away not too long ago. Bob Van Kampen, uh, Marv Rosenthal, the uh, pre-wrath view. There was also a fourth spin on dispensationalism, which would be the older, long-ago type of dispensationalism that said... Uh, Law is so different from grace, grace so different from law, there was no grace during the time of the law. Uh, there is uh, no relationship of the law to grace today, uh, which I believe is false. Uh, one of the Dallas Seminary guys, uh, Hoyt Chester Woodring, H.C. Woodring, who was an older man, went to Dallas Seminary, became an outstanding student, and he wrote this massive doctorate dissertation on grace under the Mosaic Covenant. Now here he is, a normative dispensational person writing on grace under the Mosaic Covenant, and he takes that much space to show there was a lot of grace under the Mosaic Covenant. And showed how it related to the New Testament. Tremendous job. We have it in our library. Hoyt Chester Woodring, Grace Under the Mosaic Covenant. Uh, Charles Ryrie wrote his book called The Grace of God. He's a normative dispensationalist. The Grace of God. Uh, I think he got a lot of the material out of Woodring's the, uh, dissertation, by the way but wrote a very good, articulate, shorter book on uh, the grace of God and showed there was a lot of grace in the Old Testament. In other words, normative dispensationalists 
can believe, should believe, and certainly I believe, <laughs> I think every member of our faculty believes there was a lot of grace during the time of the Mosaic Covenant. God has always been gracious. He's that way. But also that um, there's a sense in which the law is related to our lives today. In terms of like nine out of the ten commandments are repeated in Acts and the Epistles as uh, applicable, operative for us today. Uh, these set forth standards that we, through the enablement of grace, by the Holy Spirit, should be living. God has not changed his inviolable principles. Uh, so there's a lot of work that needs, as has been done, needs to be done on uh, bringing certain things together that have not been together and understanding things in the right kind of uh, weighing and perspective. And it only comes from uh, the sifting that uh, goes on when we spend a lot of time in it. Weeks, months, years down the line into the pastorate, continuing uh, when we can to, to give prophetic series and to keep studying it, reading new books, keeping, keeping after the Bible, reflect on doing our exegesis so that we can come to our own views and not just say, well, I believe it because John MacArthur believes it or I believe it because John Walford, Dallas Seminary believed it. Um, once we know those men and something about them, we think that's a pretty good idea, but uh, if we got to know Simon Kistemaker and William Hendrickson, we'd probably think the same thing. Uh, they had a lot of th good things going for them, too. We don't decide issues on those bases. We decide issues on what does the word say? <laughs> what does it mean exegetically? All right, so then we have um, crucial issues that divide interpreters, point three. I tried to put down here what are some of the main subjects uh, issues that need to be studied, uh, you need to f find out answers to, uh, so that you know where you stand on these areas. And then gradually, as you weave all these different uh, conclusions together, you, you, you eventually come to a merging where you have your whole position put together, integrated, correlated, unified, harmonious, hopefully. And so that hopefully you will not be inconsistent. But you'll be consistent uh, in whatever you teach about prophecy. But here are crucial issues. First of all, the most determinative issue, and I think it's right at the very bottom, foundation, is uh, what is our method of hermeneutics? When we say we interpret the Bible naturally and literally, what do we mean by that? And what do we actually do with certain passages? Do we say we interpret the Bible literally and naturally and go to Revelation 7 where it mentions the 12 tribes of Israel and gives the very tribes and say that means the church and then claim that we are interpreting the Bible literally, naturally? A lot of people do that. And they sway a lot of people by, by claiming that. Oh, that sounds great. He's literal. He's, uh, he's got a natural hermeneutic. Sounds plausible. And it fool people. No, I don't mean these people are people who are trying to fool people. I'm, I'm talking about people here who are honest people, like Kistemaker, uh, Hendrickson, Poitras. Uh, I don't think you can find any that are more honest than they are. But they just have a downright different understanding of what natural hermeneutics is than, than I do. When I look at that passage and it mentions the 12 tribes of Israel, gives the very name, to me, natural hermeneutics means that's what it's talking about. Most likely, at least. It would take uh, a lot of odds against that to persuade me to change from that. Because that is the natural, seeming, real claim of the passage. Pretty outrightly, pretty forthrightly. To give it another spin and say that's the church, when the language used is not the language of the church at all, but of specifically of Israel, as in dozens of Old Testament passages where these tribes are mentioned, they're literal. Why not literal here? So we'll have to decide uh, what do we mean by natural, literal hermeneutic. And even if others claim they're using it, but we see them doing that in practice, uh, we will have to make our own decisions then in terms of integrity as to what our hearts can commit ourselves to. But at the same time, not cast aspersions on these scholars and say they're dishonest. Because we do not know that. Only God does. And he will judge his servants. But we can see what they're doing and still argue against them. Hopefully in a gentlemanly, sweet way. And then let the 
hopefully let the facts speak for themselves. Not our innuendos, not our accusations, not our jabs in the ribs or such things. But the method of hermeneutics, and as far as I can tell, when, when Ezekiel 36 says that God will regather his people back to their land, Ezekiel 36, when Ezekiel 36, 28 says, to the land that I gave to your fathers. And I go back to Genesis and find out what that land was. It was the land of Palestine that God gave to Abraham, to Jacob. Then the land that I gave to your fathers means the same land. It hasn't changed. It's still the same terra firma through the centuries. It's still right there on the map. So how can I change that land to mean the land of the Christian church, so to speak? Ephesians 1.3, some Amiel's claim. Where Ephesians 1.3 says that we've been given every spiritual blessing in Christ. Well, to be given every spiritual blessing in Christ is not the same language as the land that I gave to your fathers, which is Palestine and remains Palestine. So again, now that's just one example. You go to Jeremiah 31 to 33 on the New Covenant, where again he promises in Jeremiah 32 and 33 that he will bring them back to their land. What's a natural, normative, literal hermeneutic there? Which one makes the better sense? To see that fulfilled in, in, to Israel in the land of Palestine or to see that fulfilled in some sense in the church today or in heaven? Uh, some millennials claim that we're in the millennium today on earth. Most Amils claim that on earth. There are some Amils who have claimed that they've seen some problems with that. It's gotten tight for them, so they said, no, it couldn't be. Uh, there's too much unrest on the earth. There's too much lack of peace, too much uh, lack of uh, sort of the ideal picture that you get when you read these millennial passages. Not happening on the earth. Let's uh, claim that it's happening in heaven today, where everything is perfect. So some Amils go the earthly way, some go the heavenly way today. To me, neither one of them makes sense. Because the blessings of the Christian church are not the same as the land of Palestine on earth. The blessings in heaven that are ideal are not exactly the same as Old Testament passages like Isaiah 65, which promises, yes, these physical things for Israel, but says the sinner, a sinner who is like 100 years old will die. I don't think there's any death in the eternal state. I don't think there's any death in heaven. I mean, you run into problems like very real problems. When you think about it, look up the passages. I constantly find myself looking up texts and rechecking things. Because if, if we allow ourselves to, we can get so carried away with reading what the scholars say that that's all we look at. And they sound plausible because they're brilliant scholars. They know how to turn their words. And they should know how to turn their words. But come back to the scripture. What does it say? The land that I gave to your fathers. The 12 tribes of Israel. And so on. Uh, so literal interpretation. Then B, why does the New Testament actually quote or allude to the Old Testament prophecies? There just are a whole different, whole bunch of different ways in which the, um, in which the, old, in which the New Testament will uh, refer back some way to the Old Testament. Sometimes literal quotes, pretty much. Um, sometimes broad allusions, uh, kind of general wrap-up summaries, and a whole bunch of other ways that the uh, New Testament uses the Old Testament. And we will need to work our way through those various New Testament uh, uses of the Old Testament so that we can figure out uh, which uh, perspective we will take whether they actually are claiming that uh, Old Testament passages are being fulfilled in the church. If so, are they claiming full fulfillment? Or maybe what could be called uh, partial aspects of fulfillment that are true today. Of certain um, things that will also be true, could also be true in a future time. Or are they um, just using the Old Testament passages to make some kind of an illustration but not actually claiming fulfillment. Like for example, there are normative dispensationists who take New Covenant passages like um, Matthew where, where Jesus says this, uh, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. 
This cup is the new covenant in my blood. And they will say, well, that's not claiming uh, fulfillment. It just says this cup is the New Testament, the New Covenant. It's just making a provision that will come to have its fulfillment in a future day, but not today. But when I look at that passage, to be right, right honest with you, this, this cup is the New Covenant, New Covenant of my blood. It seems to be saying to me that it's, it's the death of Christ, it's the blood of Christ, and that's true for believers even today. It doesn't, it doesn't wait till a future time before it becomes true, before it uh, becomes operative, inaugurated initially fulfilled, or whatever we call that. So I read John Masters' article, Normative Dispensationalism, in his um, article on uh, the um, Old Testament covenants in uh, the book by Wesley Willis that uh, came out on dispensationalism called uh, New Aspects of Dispensationalism. I read John Masters and I, I get quite disturbed. Uh, at, at how I feel that he is manipulating, New, I don't think he's intending to do that, but I think it's the way it turns out. He's manipulating New Testament passages to have them mean something unnatural so that it will fit with his preconceived ideas of what dispensationalism has got to claim. And I, here I am, an avowed dispensationalist. I'm just as committed to that as, as I believe he is. But as I look at the passage, it, it is not saying to me what he says it's saying to him. Then I look at the book of Hebrews, you know, where there is a testator when he dies, like Moses, uh, or when there's death, then there's fulfillment. Christ died. Moses, the old covenant. Christ, the new covenant. To me, that's saying it's fulfillment today. But I would say partial fulfillment. Because there are so many Old Testament passages that make claims about uh, regathering to their land, and in that kind of a context, the Israeli people will see uh, these blessings of the New Covenant realized for them. I'd say partial fulfillment today, at least, because of what appear to me to be very definite, normative, New Testament claims that are hard to deny. If we, if we take the natural force of what they're saying, Look at uh, 2 Corinthians 3.6 would be one example. 2 Corinthians 3.6. And when one says this, he's, he's not in any sense hurting dispensationalism. Really, he is, he is simply exegeting a passage, but he still believes that uh, these great uh, promises of the Old Covenant, of the Old Testament, will be fulfilled in uh, 3.6. He also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant. Ministers of a new covenant, Paul says. Paul sees himself as a minister of the new covenant. Well, John Masters says that. Notice it just says he's a minister of it. It doesn't say that it's, it's fulfilled today. As if he's, Paul is a minister of it, but, it's, but it itself will be something in the future. What it says to me is that he's a minister of a new covenant that's already being realized. He's ministering this, the benefits of the New Covenant. Some, some normative dispensationalists will say, well, we're under the benefits of the New Covenant, but we're not under the New Covenant. Mm -hmm. To me, that's misusing language. That's uh, trying very hard to uh, cling with our <laughs> fingernails and toenails and <laughs> not give up a position. We don't need to do that. We can be straightforward as pre dispensationalists and interpret passages, and they still won't hurt us. Uh, if we see some uh, beginning or partial fulfillment today of certain spiritual blessings, that does not mean that all of the aspects of an Old Testament passage are being realized today. But I remember that uh, God promised Abraham, I'll bless you, I'll bless your nation. Through you all nations will be blessed. Romans 4, Galatians 3 shows us that we today, by faith, are uh, among those of all nations who are enjoying uh, Abrahamic covenant blessings in the international aspect. We're already enjoying those. There is a sense in which certain aspects of the Abrahamic covenant that were given for Gentiles are being realized today as far as I can tell. Same way with the New Covenant. Uh, probably some on the same faculty here would not hold my view. Uh, but still I must look at the passages and decide for myself, so must you do. Uh, so you follow through with uh, Hebrews chapter 9 on the New Covenant. 
Uh, Masters continues to deny that these passages have anything to do with fulfillment because he sees fulfillment only in the future um, millennial time when Israel is regathered. In uh, Hebrews 9.15, and for this reason he, meaning Christ, is the mediator of a new covenant. In order that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions committed under the first covenant, those who are called, uh, who have been called, may receive the promise of the internal, uh, eternal inheritance. Apparently, we are already, the death of Christ has occurred, we're already enjoying some of the benefits. We're already under the provisions of that covenant. If we're under the provisions of that covenant, why aren't we seeing some partial fulfillment of it? Uh, so one has to face these, uh, these passages and decide uh, on point B, why does the New Testament actually quote or allude to the Old Testament prophecies? It connects with the church in some way verses that are originally relating to Israel. We've just looked at some of these on the New Covenant, for example. Joel 2, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit could be added there as another example. Acts 2, does Acts 2 claim that this is that which was spoken? Uh, sometimes dispensations will try to evade that and say, it doesn't say this is that, it says this is like that. But when I actually look at the text and exegete it, what it says is this is that, point blank. Uh, if it says this is that, to me that does not naturally, normatively sound like it means this is like that. This is merely uh, an analogy, an example of the kind of thing that will occur when the real fulfillment comes. This is that. Also in Acts 2, uh, Acts 2 cites three Old Testament passages. Psalm 16 on the resurrection, uh, Psalm 110 on um, the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool, and then thirdly the Joel 2 passage. Both of the other two passages of those three apparently are claiming fulfillment. Psalm 16 was not talking about David, it was not fulfilled in him, and it talked about resurrection, but it has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Fulfillment. And so it's been quote, it's cited for that reason, fulfillment, in Christ, not, not David. Christ has risen. Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou on my right hand. Christ has ascended into heaven to God's right hand. He is sitting there until I make your enemies your footstool. He'll do that in the great triumphs of rule which he will enact at the second advent and following. when he really takes over. But today he's sitting there at the right hand of God doing other business. And it seems to me that, uh, that Acts 2 is using that Old Testament passage to claim some already fulfillment today. If, if two out of the three passages are claiming fulfillment, then that, in the same flow, the same pattern of context, might suggest, doesn't have to, but might suggest that the third passage being quoted in the same sermon along the same lines of thought, would also be claiming some aspects of fulfillment. The Spirit has been poured out in some degree today. And Jews and Gentiles who believe are participating in the wonderful benefits of the Holy Spirit's coming. Uh, accept my logic or, or reject it. Uh, it's your choice, as you must come to your own honest conclusion. But uh, we must face uh, point B, why does the New Testament actually quote or allude to the Old Testament prophecies, and we will come to different conclusions. Masters has come to a different conclusion than I have come to. He would claim that there's no fulfillment of Joel 2 at all in Acts 2. That Acts 2 is only using that passage to show that something like that uh, is, has happened uh, in Acts 2. Uh, that bothers me. I, I say, well, here I am, a premill dispensationalist, and as far as I can tell, that's what Scripture uh, broadly and uh, deeply teaches. I feel utterly committed to it. However, uh, when I read some of my uh, people on my same team who are making claims like these I've just mentioned, who say such things, I have to make up my own decision. What does the Scripture teach? Uh, how will I face the Lord on this issue? Because it is His Word. I want to try to interpret it in a way that uh, would um, try to gather what is the natural, normative, most likely 
intent of, uh, in view of what the, the, the writer, the speaker, speaker like uh, Peter in Acts 2, is uh, trying to get at, or what the writer of the Hebrews is trying to get at. Well, when I see that's true, that there seems to be some or partial realization of uh, certain spiritual things of Old Testament promises being enacted today, uh, to me, that does not at all mean that this somehow undercuts dispensationalism. That somehow this means then that the church is Israel. Uh, there's too much evidence otherwise that that is not the case. That Israel will have its own fulfillment in its own day validly in a very full way. But that when God gave the new covenant to the house of Israel and Judah in Jeremiah 31, and that's the only passage that... that uh, it's the clearest passage on the New Covenant, Jeremiah 31, the house of Israel and the house of Judah, that certain blessings that God mentioned there were blessings that not only would be needed in the human hearts of Jewish people who believed, but would also be common spiritual blessings that would uh, as well be needed in the hearts of Gentile peoples who believed. So that to say that uh, people today who spiritually enjoy some of these blessings um, are uh, seeing a fulfillment of uh, aspects of the New Covenant is not to say that that means that's all of it, as if other details of the Old Testament passage that seem to be talking about the land and so on cannot have their fulfillment when the time comes, as God will take care of the whole picture. Uh, certainly these uh, land aspects do not appear to be being fulfilled at all today. Um, so either God has misled people by uh, saying he's going to do things, or he someday will indeed fulfill these, just as he has already literally and in detail fulfilled many aspects of Christ's first coming, born at Bethlehem, born of the tribe of Judah, and many other details right down the line, fulfilled literally. Uh, so when I look at uh, that, uh, then I say that's a good encouragement to me to believe that's one reason among many to believe that uh, when the time rolls around, he will also literally fulfill details to Israel. But that uh, he can also uh, see certain details needed in the hearts of uh, believers today uh, realized because they need these things uh, without undercutting that, that factor. All right, so we, we need to figure that out, and uh, it takes a lot of study to make your own commitments on that one way or the other. Then point C, what should we do with the Old Testament details about armaments? Uh, Old Testament passages that talk about future battles, that um, where spears and arrows and horses and chariots will be used, like Ezekiel 39, when the great northern invader comes upon the uh, mountains of Israel, comes out of the north, plunges upon the territory of Israel, and they're using bows, arrows, horses, chariots, spears, whatever. Well, some dispensationists would, and there's, here's an area where we can differ. Some dispensationists would say, well, it says bows, arrows, spears, horses, this is the way it will be fulfilled, and so then we say, how can it be fulfilled when armament has really changed? It's, it's done an evolutionary process through the centuries. Uh, under tanks, airplanes, uh, far more high-powered uh, kinds of weapons than uh, they had in those days. Well, they say uh, in the book of Revelation, when you have these terrible judgments of the seals, the trumpets, the bowls, Revelation chapter 6 uh, through 16, why uh, factory possibilities will be so destroyed in such massive judgment that man's capabilities to produce modern weaponry will be decimated, taken out of the picture, to a very large degree at least. So men will have to revert back to whatever weapons they can come up with. So they feel that natural interpretation would fit very well there, and I could say, yeah, that's plausible. I, I certainly would agree that that's plausible, and I, that would be one of the two possibilities I would entertain. But on the other hand, it seems to me that weaponry has undergone a change so that uh, the uh, writer would simply be, Ezekiel, would be describing to his people uh, things in terms of words he would know that they would understand in their day, but which when the actual fulfillment would come 
he didn't know when, we know now it would be centuries later, uh, would uh, involve um, still literal weapons, as literal as bows and arrows and horses and so on, but uh, with that uh, change in weaponry in view there. Uh, so that uh, God knew more than we knew about uh, the actual form in which it would come to be realized. Well, some would say, no, you can't take that view because uh, then if you take that view, then you're saying that the land of Palestine, literal, can change over into the land of the Christian church, spiritual. So if you can do it in one place, you can do it in the other. Well, I happen to take this second position as the most likely, and I would say, no, that is not the case. You're comparing apples with nuts, not apples with apples. The land of Palestine is a piece of real estate that remains the same through the centuries no matter what. Give or take, it's pretty much the same. It does not change. So God can bring them back to the land I gave to your fathers, Ezekiel 36, 28. And it will be the same land. On the globe, the same place. <coughs> However, weaponry does change. Colt revolver even. From the uh, 1820s, 30s, Samuel Colt, producing those early Colts uh, that uh, Samuel Walker of the Texas Rangers, John Hayes, sent him off to the east because you heard about this man that had developed a weapon that could keep spitting bullets at Indians who were amassing like three or four hundred at once to come upon 15 Rangers. And the Rangers would fire and then fall back and the other Rangers would come forward and fire theirs and the others by that time would reload it, they'd come, but the Indians would overwhelm them with sheer numbers. So John Hayes said, said go off to, John, to, to Samuel Walker, go off and find this man. I've heard he's got this, this uh, new weapon that will keep firing. Get a whole bunch of these for us. Then we'll be able to face these hordes of uh, Indians that come against us. So Walker went back there and uh, he found in a basement, after he had searched a long time, he found this guy who was almost out of it because people had not bought his weapon. And it looked like he wasn't going to make it. He just was very, very much in a very bad state. So uh, he said, I want to order several hundred of your weapons. It really put him on the, put him on the map. And then the Colt revolver has, revolved, has, he, has evolved uh, into a better weapon through time. Uh, other weapons, too, have given way to other weapons. They're still literal weapons. You're still interpreting literally. But you're understanding that the form itself may change. But you're also understanding that that's not an analogy with the land of Palestine, the form of which does not change. You see, I hope you see what I'm saying here. That, that is a false accusation against this view. So what I'm saying is that dispensationalists can take two different literal views, different literal views, an earnest desire to interpret the text, and we need to live with one another. We need to say, well, that, that other view is possible. It's still literal. We could go either way. Good thing we have two different possibilities here. <laughs> and uh, not be bothered too much about that. Uh, so what should we do with the Old Testament details about armaments? We should bother with it. We should work hard and earnest, you know, to be, be earnest about interpreting. But at the same time, once we've arrived at our conclusions that are different from some other dispensations, we, uh, we can still live together. We'll say, thank God that we have different possibilities. At least... In this case, some cases we don't have. We just have one, that's it. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. We're out of it, you know. Well, we'll stop right here. This, this is interesting, isn't it, to see that uh, we have to think our way through so many different issues. At first, it seems overwhelming. So many things coming at us at once. But as we begin to study passages and get opportunities to teach, we gradually have the hours, the opportunities to... Uh, Think about these matters, and we, we grow in our knowledge, in our storehouse of awareness. We, our notes grow, we can review them, and uh, gradually we'll come around to a position after some years where at least we have some grip on it, some balance, some uh, symmetry, some coordination, some harmony, such as a John MacArthur uh, has. It, it does, Rome wasn't built in a day, nor was a biblical uh, scholarly pastor built in a day. Uh, we are not, um, we're not shanties thrown up overnight by God. We're solid rock houses, and he's gradually putting us together. Let's remember that. And it does take time to build a rock house. You can throw up a shanty overnight. But when the blasts come on the hillside, that shanty will go down, whereas the rock house will stand. 
uh, the life that's really steeped itself in God's Word, been patient to study through the weeks, the months, the years, and to get truly deep, thorough handles on things. So that uh, one says, what about such and such a passage? And uh, you've been there. And the Holy Spirit helps you remember it. At least something about it. Maybe not the depth you'd like to, meet, to have at the moment, but some general depth about it. Or to say, great question, I don't recall exactly. I know I've looked at that, but I don't recall what I came up with. Uh, would you let me go look at my notes and I'll get back to you on it? And then be sure you do that. And your credibility will grow with people as you show that you're in earnest about this. Okay, we're dismissed.